here today with Stella O'Malley, who is one of my personal favorite people in the gender wars and a wonderful voice. Um, Stella is a psychotherapist and author of numerous books. She's the co-founder of GenSpect, which is an international alliance of professionals, trans people, detransitioners, parent groups, and others who seek high-quality care for gender-related distress. Stella is also clinical advisor for the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine and a founding member of the International Association of Therapists for Desisters and Detransitioners. She co-hosts a podcast with another therapist, Sasha Ayad, where they discuss gender from a psychological perspective. And her most recent book is co-authored with Sasha Ayad and Lisa Marchiano, and it's called When Kids Say They're Trans, A Guide for Parents. So I have Stella on today to talk about the book, to discuss her work, and um, I have the book here on my Kindle. So we're going to discuss a lot of what's in the book. It's a really, it's it's an incredible guide and resource for parents dealing with gender distressed kids. Um, you know, at the risk of sounding hyperbolic, it's almost a comprehensive guide, I would say. It covers so much. And um, I have to say for myself, the most heartbreaking thing in this entire gender um, situation, this gender, what do I even call it? The war is, a, I already used that term, but this phenomenon. entire, yeah, <laughs> phenomenon. Thank you. Um, the saddest thing that I personally experienced in talking to someone was talking to parents yeah. who, and this was behind the scenes, it wasn't an interview that I did, but um, seeing the pain in their eyes when they discussed losing their children to this process of medical, potentially medically transitioning and even socially transitioning. So it was really hard to, that conversation was... Um, was very hard. They were asking for advice. And um, it was a parent group that invited myself and Mary Kate Fain to come speak with them after we did some podcasts kind of giving advice to other young women dealing with gender issues or even just being critical of gender ideology. So I'm so glad that this book is out for, you know, those parents and all the thousands of parents dealing with this right now. So Stella, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I really appreciate having you here today. Uh, thank you very much for welcoming me. It's lovely to be here. I love I love your podcast and I love chatting with you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and the other thing, of course, recently GenSpect had a wonderful, successful, by all means, from what I saw, conference in Denver, Colorado. And then, of course, there was this huge controversy that has also occurred um, after the conference, which we'll touch on later, but you know, the main, that's not the main important thing here. The main important thing is of course Stella's work and her thoughts, but we are going to touch on that. So if that's, you know, what you want to hear, stay tuned. Um, we'll get into that. So yeah, Stella, thank you. I really appreciate it. You have such a wisdom and such a, I think I, I really trust your intuition and your, um, your guidance on these issues. So let's get into the book. Um, what has the reception been like from parents since the book came out? Oh, uh, I'm really glad because we wrote this book, myself, Sasha and Lisa Marciano, uh, Sasha Ayad. We wrote it for the parents and it's a book that is unapologetically pro-parent. And what it is, is trying to give parents a kind of almost a, a, a manual that they can refer to when the million different issues arise when a, pair, a child questions their gender. And we knew that there was loads of pro-transition books out there, but there weren't many that were pro-parent or certainly pro, um, let's explore maybe any deeper meaning behind an urge to medically transition. And so it was a labour of love because we're the three of us are way overworked. And I, I, I was really into writing this book and I really felt like I was annoying them because they were like, yes, yes, we must write it. But it was, we all knew that we had to have this book. We knew that we had to write it. But it definitely did feel like it was taking a chunk out of our year last year when we were writing it. And, you know, it was, it was, it's tricky enough writing a book with three people. We're very aligned in how to approach gender. 
it's the actual logistics of writing. Who's writing this? Who's writing this? Who's doing this edit? That was the hard bit. The actual knowing, you know, what to write and what to say. Honestly, we had said it so many times in parent meetings and parent consultations, in my kind of parent membership site, in working with orgy to young people, working with detransitioners. We had just, we've been eating and living and breathing gender for some years now. And with the three of us have a WhatsApp group and we talk about it all the time. So it's it's definitely our subject. And I was just so glad to finally be able to say to parents, here's something that will just be on your side that is very pro-family, pro-parent and pro you helping your child, your specific child. So it's very much take what you need and leave the rest because some of it won't apply at all to some parents, but some of it will very much apply. And that's why I call it a kind of manual. You dip in and you dip out for many of the different issues. Yeah, that the word manual makes sense applied to the book yeah. um, because you've got, you know, you might have your child there, either boy or girl. So, you know, there's sections in the book about boys, sections yeah. about girls. So you might Older, not need everything. younger. Right. You know, because if range. a child, yeah, if a child is four or five, like I was when I was a kid, I was one of those gender kids in a different era. But um, they can be left to their own devices, frankly, and left to do whatever the hell they want. Um, if they're distressed, one would kind of help them with their distress. But there's no need to kind of impose any sort of kind of regulation on those children at all. And, and in a way, like being very aware that if it's a childhood onset versus if it's, you know, some sort of rapid onset in adolescence, it's a very different texture. It's a very different type. And there's an emerging group of young adults that I think parents are particularly feeling at sea because the kid has gone to college. And then they've suddenly come back, you know, at Thanksgiving or Christmas to declare a trans identity that has come from nowhere. So yeah, yeah different there was... ages matters. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much matters because you've got, like you said, like really young little kids, it's going to be a completely different approach for the parents than a 13 year old or even, you know, an 18 year old there. That was something that I was actually surprised by in the book, how much um, anguish there, because I just didn't really think about it, but how yeah. much anguish there is for when the child has already turned 18. Now they're going to transition. You have less power even than a you lot had less. before. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's terrifying. And we, we're used to this because we're meeting them all the time. But, the, you know, the parents of the 12 year old who might be really obsessed with medical transition, that parent has a lot of power over that child. There's a lot of impact. You know, there's so many ways to help a 12, 13, 14 year old. As they get older, your ability to help your child is significantly reduced by the time they're 18 or 19 or 20. Even if you love them with all your everything, you know, you, the natural order of things means they've moved away from you. And you aren't there. Um, you aren't such an influence. And the powerlessness of the parents of adult children is like you said earlier, when you met the parents, I think when they write the analysis, when they write the history of gender in the 21st century, there's going to be a very special chapter given over to those parents and the trauma and the anguish that was they suffered. And that was put upon them and how I have to believe because I've, I've studied it so deeply, you know, queer theory rips families apart. It dismantles and destabilizes the family unit and it's parents who are more devastated because the children it's happening to the parents. It's their entire family unit is being destroyed by an external an external. I remember one parent coming to me. And he, 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 he kept on getting this sensation that he was getting mugged when he was walking down the street. And I was like, well, I can see why somebody's come and attacked your child as such with an external influence that you never saw coming. I could see how you'd continuously feel like you're getting mugged. Yeah, it's it's such an it's an interesting point that the parent, I mean, for the child, they are always going to go through stuff, always going to go through hardships. As we grow, we're always going to experience things that we might later regret or that make us suffer. But to watch that as a parent powerless to stop it, something that is so permanent. When I was reading the book, I was finding myself thinking like, God, the, the parents must be just, they wish their kid was like, you know, cutting themselves or bulimic or something, because that would be such a, I mean, that's sort of, a morbid well, to be to honest, <laughs> very often the kids are 
doing other things, whether it's eating disorders or self-harming, it rarely seems to come in on, on its own. The, 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 these are really the most vulnerable kids, the most distressed kids, the most gullible kids. They're a typical type of kid that are particularly the adolescent onset, not the younger ones, um, but the, the older ones, they're really, really vulnerable. So they are often self-harming and, you know, a lot of eating disorders. In fact, I've often, I, you know, we're still in the middle of, of figuring out what is gender, what has happened, you know, what is gender distress with it. Um, but one thing I do think is I very often land back in the world of eating disorders and how often it seems to be very linked around eating disorders and body dysmorphia and I want a sculpted body and I'm too fat and I don't like my body and I don't like this. It's really, it's not always, not always by a long shot, but it's definitely very linked to some people. It's yeah, like a it new makes, form of an eating disorder almost. It makes sense. It's yeah. um, <clears throat> seeking the sense of control over your body, yeah. right? I mean, that's... Shaping it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the eating disorder, it can, I know people, it, it gives them the sense of control and it's almost this exhilarating feeling of like, okay, I can finally do something to make my body look how I want it to look and it's power. always end point there's measurable there's all it's, there's a kind of pathway it's it's an awful lot of mirror checking the level of mirror checking with gender distress or hiding mirrors or you know showering in the dark or else incessant looking at mirrors it's it's really really focused on on how they look and I think we sometimes underestimate that because they talk about how they feel all the time a massive level around what they look like in a world that's frankly look except uh, obsessed you know yeah absolutely and and body obsessed and yeah. i mean also we are something i've been learning about lately is how much our bodies are in charge even more than our brains in yeah. in some cases you know like we we think for example if we get really upset about something like extreme distress that we can use our brains to calm down but in reality it's kind of the other way around the body has to send the signals to the brain from what i've been reading about somatic therapies and things i, like I that. agree mm -hmm. i think we underestimate it and i think these digital natives these kids are you know they come of age in the digital era and they see their bodies as almost mr potato man where they can kind of, you know, get breasts or remove breasts or they can get muscles through, you know, testosterone or they can, you know what I mean? And they're kind of sculpting their body in a very kind of digital way. And um, anybody who really starts to get to know the body, they realize how much impact the body has on the brain. Do they call the stomach the fourth, bra fourth brain, don't they? Or something like that. Yeah. It's as far as like it's it's the kind of, it really shapes our moods. It shapes our, 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 our mentality about so many things. I think we might come out of this with more respect for our physiological responses and our, our bodies in general. And I agree with you. I, I, I do think all these, you know, all these chemicals and foods and stuff like that. You'd wonder, you know, when we do the full analysis of all of this, where it all came from. There's so many different ingredients that have created this perfect storm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, like, for example, because you said the chemicals in the foods, there's one thing that they've done, I think some studies that have shown that red dye 40, which is in a lot of candy, it can cause ADHD symptoms in children. And, you know, I see that in I tutor kids and I see that the kids it's like the parents are giving or the even the teachers are giving them lollipops and then saying oh they have ADHD um <laughs> which and it may be it may be true they may have you know something really diagnosable as ADHD but um yeah there's so many different ingredients like you said literal and figurative but um also you know in the book you talk a lot about the parents reactions and I thought it was really it was really beautiful how you wrote about the um the parents emotions through all of this that they may feel disgust they may feel yeah. extreme anger um at the child or just at the influences on the child um and you talk about how the parent can deal with that within themselves it seems like that would be a really really big obstacle for them as they're trying 
not to go crazy with their kid and let it all come out on the child. They're trying to take this measured, you know, response so that they can ultimately achieve what they want, which is for the kid to desist. Yeah, I think, you know, people underestimate disgust. It's a it's a primary re- reflexive almost emotion that uh, we have fear, you know, surprise, disgust, um, anger. Um, you know, they're, they're, I don't know if they're the, all the primary emotions, but certainly disgust is one of them. And disgust is something that some people have a higher level. Apparently, by the way, females have high, more sensitive to disgust than uh, men. And, you know, if you were to get evolutionary about it, you could understand why, because we need to be aware of, let's say, poisonous foods and stuff like that. But that's where it comes from, if you follow me. But yeah, an awful lot of parents have talked about disgust as a visceral reaction to maybe their very overweight child who now has, you know, body hair and, you know, hair on their back and hair on their chest and they were born a female and they've had a mastectomy and their voice has completely changed. And, you know, we've never really lived in a world where our voices have changed, our physicality has completely changed so that you wouldn't recognise, like, testosterone is a beast. It really, really, if you or I were to take it, it would be we would be almost unrecognizable in a year or two. Like it's unbelievable. It thickens the skin. It just sh- it shapes the face, shapes the body. It does so much of a change that I can see why parents are looking. Going as one one parent said to me, you know, I I I I loved you know Mary. She was lovely, but but John, who she's turned into, is a der- very different person. Walks different, talks different, speaks, acts very differently. These are very different people. And, you know, they, they really do seem to be. So, you know, the way you were saying how much our, our body shapes us. When you put in a hormone, when you put in body changing hormones that not only changes your body, but changes your confidence levels, your, your libido, your energy, your, your ability to think in different ways. Are we creating a different person? It's, it's, it's seismic, the changes. And some parents just seem to react in a very visceral level. And who am I to judge them? You know, who am I to judge them? All I want to know is, uh, can I kind of acknowledge that this is happening to many parents? And can they make their peace with it and see how they want to move forward from that? Also, you know, some parents might have children who have become incredibly sexualized as a result of their transition. And I remember one parent saying, like, when when he has his trans voice on, it's it's just very sexualized and it, it kind of gives me the creeps. I could see how that could be, you know, if 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 certain certain voices can see sound very sexualized and it can feel a bit creepy. So, you know, it's all, I, I'm very much there, but for the grace of God, go I like I I God knows what it's like to live through it, but I I know my responses would be very powerful. And it's parental responses because they they thought they were bringing up this child and now they have another child and they're just trying to wrap their head around it. And in the middle of it all is gender ideology that is kind of just shaping the whole situation. Right. On top of everything you're dealing with at home and the yeah. family, it's all coming from this massive external pressure, this, you know, almost cold. I mean, you, you write about in the book the similarities between kids who come out of this and people who come out of a cult this is where their whole sense of their future has been maybe destroyed maybe shifted you know and they now have to kind of recalibrate when they do hopefully come out of it um yeah and, mm-hmm. some of the you know we've heard of some lovely stories of detransitioners who come back to their family and it, it can be very very heartwarming we also hear a lot of stories where it isn't heartwarming and it's actually very, very difficult. These are very distressed people who come back. They often blame their parents. They often feel very angry and feel that they could have gone a different road with different help. The parents often feel very helpless. It it can be a really hard, you know, it's it's not necessarily, I, I, I think Richie Heron described it well and he said, he said, it's not detransition, it's recovery from t- transition. And I, I think he's hitting on something there. And I think it's really frightening. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. It's, it's a healing process, mm -hmm. physically and emotionally and mentally and familially. And going back to what we were talking about, about the body being, you know, in charge or the body being where things come from or where things have to take place. Um, the healing process, I would think, is very much about and of course, it's in the book, you know, getting comfortable in the body again, but specifically like unfocusing, you know, or refocusing on the external rather than obsessing with yourself. And there were some stories about, you know, kids who went to work on a farm or work, you know, some kind of nature situation. There's probably not a lot of mirrors around where they are there, you know, and they're um, getting into something outside of themselves, outside of the Internet. And that's helping them come back to reality and start that healing process. Yeah. Um, and then, mm -hmm, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, we used it like a lot, say, you know, try and get the kids out into nature and stuff. More and more we find, because parents come back and tell us and stuff, that the internet gets those kids everywhere. <laughs> it's unbelievable how far that reach has. Amazon jungle and wherever else, you know. So um, in a way, it's one of those things we have to manage in our lives. But I'm very into semester at sea, get out into a farm. Uh, I'm really into um, volunteering, you know, anything that will bring the child out of themselves and thinking about themselves towards something that they're thinking about their place in the world and how they might help people in the world. Right. Volunteering is often overlooked as a treatment method for people who are dealing with mental yeah. health issues because it's it makes you I mean, doing acts of empathy kind of makes you feel better about yourself, you know, so. Oh, they've studied it. Out, it does. Mm -hmm. it, it actually does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, that it's a completely different focus from the inward kind of always think about what do you feel like? What do you want to be? What do you want to look like as you referenced? And um, there was one story that I wanted to talk to you about from the book that was really incredible. And it was um, this one mom who said that she kind of went along or, or pretended to go along with the idea of medical transitioning in order to stall it, but in order to stay in control so yeah. that there wouldn't be an outside influence who would come in and either, you know, take her child if there was a social worker getting involved or that's what she was really afraid of um or just people intervening and helping her child do it um clandestinely but she also had regrets it seems like and that was what you know i was referencing i thought was beautiful the way you allowed for the parents to have the full range of emotions but there it seems like they're really gonna have regret no matter what they end up doing if their child has gotten sucked into this. Um, but this parent had amazing success where she stalled everything. And sh she said she was kind of playing with fire. It was risky, but she managed to um, stall things and then it didn't. And then her daughter did desist. Yeah, I remember that particular um excerpt from the parent and it, it's it's really thoughtful I thought it was a really brilliant um uh insight that she brought to her piece about how she handled it she almost went underground you, you know what I mean uh, and uh had to kind of create this world where she was walking on eggshells all the time now arguably things have moved on a little bit in some countries so arguably that the need to be um, pretend to be kind of pro-trans identification um, and pro-medical transition. It's not quite as as uh, high or heightened as it used to be in, for example, let's say the UK or Ireland, because there's a, leg a legitimate side now that people say fast-tracking medicalization isn't the most appropriate. But in some cases like Canada or, you know, Australia, that you really you are in severe danger of the social workers coming and taking your child and your your family being ripped apart with court cases and stuff so um i think uh that what that parent said she was very it was very poignant because she said you know she lost the years she lost the years with that child and there's a real sadness she the child did desist 
but the, the reading of it, you just think, wow, this ripped this ripped this family apart. Mm-hmm. And have you heard of families where the child was actually taken away um, through social workers? Yeah, I have heard quite a number of families and each story is so harrowing. It's almost indescribable because the parent invariably feels completely powerless. Probably the most common scenario is when one parent is affirming and they're split, they're divorced. One parent is affirming, the other isn't. And the kid like we're putting this burden of responsibility on the kid it's child-led it's not child-centered it's child-led and so these are you know distressed 12 year olds or 13 year olds who are leading the way and they don't know how to handle the the power and uh, they can end up completely alienating from the non-affirming parent and uh, often you know that the, there is no there's complete breakdown and uh, that, that non-affirming parent again and again we've worked with them they might go to the courts seeking, you know, the right to see their child and they don't get it. They don't get it because the parent, the child doesn't want it. And uh, the uh, courts agree. And uh, the affirming ch- a parent who invariably, may I say, was the less involved parent in the first place. Very often the father, the affirming parent, not always, not always, but often uh, is the one who uh, just kind of sits back, just says, yeah, because affirming is easier. Say yes. And affirming everything and a yes to whatever the child wants is definitely the easier path. The harder path is 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 exploring cautiously, slowing it down, saying not quite yet. I, I don't know enough about this yet. I'm just going to wait. No, I'm taking this position of responsibility as your parent seriously. So I'm not going to. Affirm. That takes energy. It takes resistance. It takes a huge amount more fortitude than affirming. So there's no doubt that if you're a, an unengaged parent, it's much easier to, to affirm. I'm not saying all affirming parents are, because some affirming parents come from a really loving place and they honestly think it's the most appropriate thing because the clinicians have told them. And I really do believe that the villains of this are the clinicians who should know better, who are being paid very high salaries to take the responsibility of first doing no harm, of making sure that they're aware of any um, perils in any decision that they make and uh, to neglect and abdicate their 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 responsibility i think is is uh, unforgivable so everybody has their own kind of villains of the piece for me it's the, the clinicians by a long shot yeah absolutely they've i mean you've got surgeons who are removing the breaths of 13 yeah. year old girls you've got surgeons who are in the united states doing penile inversion on boys as young as 15 um so this is you know really happening and it's this frankenstein-esque situation with you know the surgery alone that's just the surgery when you get to the hormones the puberty blockers the the therapists who affirm the delusion of the child and don't question what else is going on you know what else is hurting you and um going back to what what you mentioned in the beginning where this is really um a pro-parent book oh yeah something that's interesting is how parents really get it from all sides in this culture war because you've got even the you know the american conservative side they very much come out against transgender ideology but and they claim to be pro-parent in that they argue for parental freedoms um, but they are very anti-parent when it comes to parents who have been sucked into this, who may be affirming because they're being told by all of the experts and all of the authorities who they've trusted um, to, they, they're being told to transition their kid. So, you know, the parents are just trying to do their best. The vast majority of parents are trying to do the best yeah. for their kids. I, you know, yeah. So you many know. parents, they're being told... Oh, just close the computer for your child or just get them off the Internet. And it's like you wait till you meet one of those kids. They are utterly indoctrinated. They do feel like that they have been completely brainwashed. They speak, think, breathe identity. And um, they're often gullible and sweet and kind of vulnerable and a little bit all over the place. So this simplistic idea that all they have to do is close the computer. It's like the horse has so 
bolted by the time oh I'll close the computer like so many of the parents have tried that and they're like made no difference or six months in they're still breathing the cult you know what I mean so I think the parents get a really hard time online and the parents are it's you know I'll never forget the first parent meeting I had I'll never forget it now I've met many many detransitioners and their stories are each uniquely devastating but it was the sameness and the the quantity of the parents who, who, who and the helplessness and the the liveness of it if you follow me it was an unfolding medical scandal while for the detransitioner it had happened something dreadful had happened it was the kind of and tomorrow they're going to get a mastectomy and today they tried to die by suicide but the surgeon says it's a, it's irrelevant because it wasn't to do with gender and you're like what is this 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 is properly crazy it really is a a, a really a harrowing horrible phenomenon that's happened mm -hmm. and i mean did you ever expect anything like this in your career because of course before you before this topic exploded yeah. you were working with kids working with parents yeah yeah, um, I, I, I was a bog standard, you know, um, psychotherapist, worked a lot with parents, an awful lot with teenagers. Funnily enough, my first book was called Cottonwool Kids and an awful lot of these ROGD kids, these rapid onset, are very like the Cottonwool Kids I described in 2015. I had no idea I was going to get into gender. No idea, you know, in 2015. I was just tootling along, you know, a nice life. And loved writing my books, loved writing for the national media. And um, my my heart has always been in mental health. And my heart has really always been with teenagers and parents because I was an unhappy teenager myself. And um, then this thing exploded, gender exploded in my life. And for the first few years, I felt I didn't know enough. So I was quite tight lipped and I, I did the film, you know, Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. But I knew I, I wasn't. The premise of that film was to go in as a greenhorn, like is to go in with as a psychotherapist who's interested in mental health to figure out what's going on with this phenomenon. So I was no, by no means an expert, either going into the film or leaving the film. I was just like, what's going on here? And by the end of the film, I was like, oh, my God, something massive is happening that is indescribable to anybody who doesn't actually know so suddenly it's almost you're ousted from ordinary society because you either know or you don't know and after the film I kind of knew what was going on with gender nobody around me I live in the middle of rural Ireland nobody knew obviously my husband did but nobody else really got what was happening so I did it does put you outside I don't know if that's happened to you in your ordinary day to day world, but it's a, it's a kind of a very strange feeling of being um, you're, you're kind of become an outsider in society. And then I just more and more I couldn't look away. It was just so awful what was happening that more and more I just I kind of ended up doing a master's at PhD. I'm in the middle of a PhD on on gender. And I just really over the last couple of years really got involved and, you know, founded Genspect and other organizations just to help the effort to kind of bring this uh, gender ideology out into the public sphere so that people realize what's going on. Yeah, and I think, I mean, if I were one of these parents, this book would become like my Bible, you know, this, this book. It, it, it's got to be so incredibly helpful. Yeah, right there. I and, hope it um, is. I really hope it is. I think so. And I wanted to ask you if there's any particular story that really stands out as just one of the most heartrending or, you know, upsetting stories that you've heard about a kid well, transitioning. Oh, God. So many. So many. So many. There was one I was going to pick up because it, 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 it's a, it kind of it's in the book as a sad story because they're estranged. But I've since heard they've come together like, you know, an estrangement. The child has come back to the family unit. So that's really nice to hear. The estrangement. Are often the most bleak stories because you feel everybody's in pain here. The kids are in pain. The parents are in pain. They uh, can't seem to find their way back. Too much, too much has happened. Too much, it's all too much. Unforgivable events have happened, and betrayal, 
And I think the estrangement is the most helpless for everybody. Everybody feels powerless and it's it's very hard to get back on your feet after an estrangement if you're a parent. And I think that's or a child. You know, I, I, I feel the estrangement is where it's the saddest, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the estrangement, it's it takes away a lot of the hope, I would imagine. Really does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really does. It really, and I, yeah. it, I've noticed a growing number of estrangement. And I wish I wasn't saying this, but I have noticed it. I've also noticed a growing number of detransitioners, a growing number of desisters. So it's a growing number of everything, really. But the estrangement always makes me feel incredibly sad and helpless. You know, I'm, I'm naturally somebody who wants to help. There's not much you can do in the face of estrangement. There really isn't. Right. When that child has gone off and rejected the parents yeah. and is not speaking with them. And is often yeah. very unhappy, mm-hmm. but blames the parent because they've been effectively brainwashed to blame the parent. Right, right. And people yeah. do that all through their lives. They still blame their parents um, for things. And I mean, wow, Stella, you're really busy. You must be really busy because you've got this PhD. Oh. You, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got I the book you just wrote. Uh-huh. <laughs> But I plan to do less next year. The last okay. couple of years, I just, it always reminded me of a friend of mine who once told me that he was, when he was a student in the early 80s, he was traveling through Africa and he, he, he basically traveled in his student way into the famine in Ethiopia. And I was like, what did you do? And he goes, what could I do? I stayed a year there. He said, you couldn't leave. Like, you couldn't just walk away having seen what, you know, and I helped, you know, I helped soups and soup kitchen stuff. And I kind of feel that's kind of what's happened to me. I fell into gender. And what could I do? I've just never worked so hard in my entire life. And I was always a hard worker, but I have never worked at the pace I've just been working at in the last few years. I've never gone up that pace. Like, you know, the, the sleepless nights and the extraordinary level of output. But anyway, I do think that it has moved. The, the, the needle has moved. I do think things are coming out. I do think like this book being published now, I'm not sure that would have got out a few years ago. You know what I mean? There's lots of different things like that. There's so many resources for everybody, whether they're detransitioners, parents, trans widows, children, everybody seems that everybody is, is it's coming out. So I, I kind of feel that next year, if, if I do nothing, I, I really want to work less and see. Famous last words. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope you do get a little bit of a break um, at some point. But that famine analogy is very funny. You know, stay and help. Um, that, yeah, I can see that. That definitely makes sense. Um, for someone like you, it seems like, you know, you're you're driven by that. Yeah. Um, and so you've got, so, I mean, you've talked about the book and you mentioned the PhD, the conference was something that must have been a ton of work to organize um so maybe we'll touch on that now so the conference that happened in november 2023 in denver colorado the genspec conference um it looked incredible i wanted to go but you know i couldn't go but it was um i mean there were so many speakers and panels and detransitioners and um currently identified trans people and concerned people from all all over Parents. the spectrum different political views were represented mm-hmm. um and it was this incredible um moment really where something is happening it's not online it's not even you know a step up from online in a book or something like that it's in real life it's people getting together talking professionals getting together and talking it's like finally this is what we need this is just what we need um and it was gaining, you know, a lot of attention and a lot of traction. And then there was <laughs> this insane, insane situation online of a cancel mob, which I think really goes to show just the universal nature of people, whatever side they're on to um, react with censorious um, intent to want to control other people control what they say and how they work and how they express themselves. So just to give a quick summary, if people don't know what happened, um, after the conference, 
Jen Specht tweeted out a picture of a young detransitioner, a woman, and she was standing and posing with a middle-aged looking guy in a dress. And um th- and the tweet said, check out um, you know, Phil's book. And Phil was the guy in the picture. And he has written a book on autogynephilia, which he says, you know, he has, and he terms it auto heterosexuality. Mm-hmm. So this angered a lot of people. And there was a huge emotional reaction. And there's a bunch of different threads here because there's just people disagreeing, which I think is fine. There's people having an emotional reaction, a knee jerk reaction, which I think is expected, but whether it's actually helpful, I don't know. Um, And then there's the cancel people. So tell me if you, you know, agree with that assessment, but I think there's kind of those different strains. Um, Um, Well, thank you for your kind words about the conference. It was a very special conference. The the concept of it is where where we, Genspect, want to bring about you know, the downfall of W Path. We think they're the root stem and branch of of the issue. Uh, They're the HQ. And so we've chosen that wherever W Path are having a conference, we're going to have a counter conference where we offer a wider picture. It's called the Bigger Picture Series. And we offer everything, lawyers, feminists, philosophers, detransitioners, parents, um, educators, um, all the different kind of many different groups who are interested in gender and who are and saying the w path sorry to interrupt you just yeah. in case people don't know w oh path, yeah world professional association of transgender health right so they write the guidelines so far they've been accepted as writing you know the there were there were a fringe gender. group they started in 1978 they released the first standards of care in 1979 this fringe group that nobody had very much interest in for many 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 years and then in the last 20 years, activists have basically taken over this organization and they have led this organization. So they're 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 purported to be a scientific medical organization. They're not. This is an activist led organization. And the first uh, presentation on in our conference in Denver was Michael Schellenberger, who has the WPATH files. And he his the name of his talk is uh, how to end WPATH. Or how WPATH must end. And he, he's determined to bring down WPATH. And we want to help him in every way that he can. We can because we believe that WPATH has become a, a force for ill. You know, we don't think it's, it's a healthy um, organization. We think that it causes a good deal more pain than it uh, resolves. We think that they're dismissive and cavalier around the detransitioners. And we think that they are advocating for really, really, really inappropriate uh, interventions. They took away all the minimum age limits, age requirements for interventions such as mastectomies and really quite serious, irreversible surgical interventions. They took away minimum age requirements. They're they're a really, really retrograde, regressive organisation that is pseudoscientific, pseudomedical. It really isn't. It's an activist-led. So we're determined to kind of offer an alternative. And in, in our uh, Denver conference, we, off, we launched the gender framework and it's a non-medicalized approach to gender related to stress. And our concept in Genspect is we're trying to bring in everybody. We're, we're an umbrella organization. Of course, there's an awful lot of disagreements because, you know, the feminists don't agree with necessarily the uh, detransitioners and the detransitioners don't necessarily agree with the parents. So this is spiky. You know, there's no doubt about it that we happen to be an organization that's trying to represent basically the downfall of gender ideology in whatever way it will manifest, because we believe it's been a force for ill. And um, yet the conference was the idea was to bring all these uh, voices together rather than leave them in their silo. So the psychiatrists are talking to psychiatrists and the lawyers are talking to the lawyers. We need to bring them all together. That was very successful. The conference was very successful. The picture, you know, of uh, the autogynophile Phil Illy, I think, um, you know, it, it, it was a very hard one to kind of figure out because had Jen Speck chosen not to post a picture of an autogynophile having been requested, 
um, do they, uh, then it's turning it into a secret. And I don't think Genspec should have secrets. I don't think Genspec should um, uh, hide the fact that there was an autogynophile at the uh, conference. I do know other autogynophiles who've attended other conferences like the LGB Alliance. And um, they're effectively secret autogynophiles. And I'm like, okay, so is this how the world is, is asking us? Because if you wear a dress, you're parading your fetish and you're asking people to be involved in your fetish. That's the kind of the accusation that's leveled at Genspec that we we supported somebody who was parading their fetish or, or asking everybody to participate in their fetish. But the other way would be asking everybody to uh, collude in a secrecy and we're very much into let's talk about it and you know the mistake we probably made uh, that I, I, I'm i very conscious of is we put up on our website I don't know when in the last maybe eight weeks um, I don't know when it was, it was during the summer maybe um, uh, Phil Lilly's book now, it had come very highly recommended by three different people who I know very, very well, who are very good friends and colleagues of mine. So this was not a lightly recommended book. It was very heavily recommended, but I hadn't read it and other people on the Genspec team hadn't read it. And we weren't aware that there was a couple of lines in it that suggested medical transition for children was the appropriate thing. For that reason alone, we pulled it down because, well, it could be other reasons, but for that reason, we definitely had to pull that book down because we don't agree with medical transition for children on any level. And so it was very important that we pulled it down. But like, it's a live website. We put things up and we take things down and we curate it and we, you know, we think that sentence is wrong and this sentence is right. And, we, you know, that's what we do at our website all the time. The thing about Genspect is we're not trying to be perfect. We're trying to be, you know, reasonable and decent and reliable. And we believe that this kind of the, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And this kind of demand of perfection has has silenced an awful lot of people in this particular world, because there are so many very, very clever people who will give you very good analysis of why it's wrong or right. But I suppose why I feel quite um, why it's been so devastating the last few weeks and it has been utterly devastating was it was a great conference and that kind of got sidelined all because of uh, a person who came to our conference in a dress and I, I don't see the policy that we could make that would be reasonable that and all I was interested was in the policy it's like yeah was he wrong to wear the dress yeah he probably was was he parading it yes he probably was could we in all good conscience ask him to leave for wearing a dress? I can't see why we could, because he behaved impeccably. He was a perfect gentleman. He didn't intrude or impose upon him anybody. If people felt uncomfortable, and I'm sure they did, lots of people felt uncomfortable about lots of different people in the conference. And honestly, when you like ride the subway today, you'll feel uncomfortable with various different people. We are always coming face to face with different people's predilections, sometimes with their sexuality or their uh, sexual fetishes. And we do not want to be in front of it. You know, th that is part of living in the public realm that you are faced with kind of the discomfort of rubbing up against other people. And that is a that is a, a kind of a challenge. But for for Genspect, all I was interested in it was had we made a mistake and if we'd made a mistake, what should we have done? That's all I wanted to know. And um, like I could, I still can't think of a policy that could say if you're an autogynophile, you can't wear a dress because that would be asking people to participate in your fetish. But if you aren't an autogynophile, you can. I, I can't see how we could test that. I can't see how we could. And people would say, but this person was a known gynophile, autogynophile. And I'd be like, yeah, I didn't know he was going to wear a dress. We didn't know he's going to wear a dress. And when it happened, to hide it doesn't seem appropriate either. So I, I think we were put in a very, very invidious position. And I don't think we handled it well. But I would say in our defense, I think it did turn into a massive cancel culture. And I do think there was a lot of reasons. I could give you a very long and detailed analysis of what the reasons were. But certainly I've. I've written a book about bullying, you know, and it's it's my most um, best-selling book. And I, I've, I've always worked with bullying. And I, I do think online mobs are 
incredibly compelling. You know, we, we all know that, you know, you know, there's a mobbing going on and you just can't help reading it. It's so fascinating. It's like watching a car crash. So I do understand our need to, to read. Um, I do think that if there was a group of people going down the street right now to tell me where I've gone wrong. And if this group of people were all polite and decent people, but there was over 100 of them. You know, as they say, you know, quantity has its own quality. So when it's 100 people and then more people join this group of people who were coming down to tell me in very reasonable terms exactly where we've gone wrong, that's a mobbing. And if you join that, you're joining a mobbing. And um, that's just the quantity part, part of it. And I understand I've, I've done it myself. I've tossed in a comment and then I've thought to myself, actually, I just taken part in a mob only because I had my point, my very clever point to make. But honestly, when it's reached thousands, when there's thousands of people making a comment, people need to realise you're part of a mob. And I do think that's what happened. I do think people definitely attacked Genspect rather than I think there was an actual golden opportunity to talk about autogynophilia. How do we handle it in society? How do we handle the fact that, you know, honestly, Phil behaved perfectly. I could not fault, apart from provocatively wearing the dress and putting Genspect in such a difficult position and the behaviour afterwards online. But like during the conference, you know, Phil was perfect. You know, he really was. I've Too many people have told me he used the boys' men's toilets and all that sort of stuff. And um, he doesn't ask people to call him she, her. And, you know, what can we ask of people in life? People sometimes want to wear unusual clothes. There was more than Phil wearing unusual clothes. There was other people wearing unusual clothes. And I'm not sure what we should do about that. I've no interest in policing that. So long as there isn't a sexual kind of behavior being kind of, absolutely um presented within it and the dress was it it mightn't have kind of looked that like that online but the dress just didn't seem like a provocative dress it was just a very blue dress but it was covering up if you follow me there was everything was covered up and when everything is covered up it doesn't feel sexual it didn't feel sexual it felt provocative which is a slightly different thing than sexual if you follow me but yeah it's been a, a grueling, awful experience. And um, one thing that loads of people have, you know, there's a there's a few organizations that pretend to be safeguarding organizations and they don't understand what safeguarding is because safeguarding has some golden rules. And one of them is that you're proportionate, you know, that your response is proportionate to the uh, to the sin, to the crime. And another would be that you um, you make a complaint in the correct manner to the correct person. So these uh, pseudo safeguarding organizations that start brawls on, on Twitter, that's anti-safeguarding. That's not the way to do it. You send an email. And do you know, in all of this, we still haven't received one email yet. It's been all Twitter on Substack and YouTube. But we haven't received one email about it, which is startling about how Twitter based it was. Well, that's ridiculous. Wow, what an interesting thing to hear. You haven't received one email. Um, I mean, I'll just give my own opinion on that. How pathetic, you know, for people to not address that in a in a way that could actually get a result, you know. Yeah. And I think a lot of this is people who they don't want to get a good result. They want to be outraged and sit behind their keyboard where they're safe. And you know, how dare they attack someone who spends their life working on this and tell them they need to do it the way that person wants it done. That's a narcissism to want it to want to see your own um to see everything how you want it mirrored back to you um yeah i don't know I, yeah go on well i was just gonna say I, I i like your point about what what policy can there be um because you know that it reminds me of the free speech debate where personally as a you know, advocate for free speech. I've really thought about this, and I don't think there can be any policy that outlaws uh, hate speech. If you know, if some people don't believe even hate speech is a coherent concept, but hateful speech, you could say, or speech you don't like, because everyone is going to have their um, their 
piece that makes that that bothers them that they would have banned you know i have stuff that triggers me that i wouldn't want to hear but because everybody has a different view of what that is and anything you say could be taken by someone as their thing that they don't like there just cannot be a policy where you ban the speech of anyone even if it's a nazi or someone like that because you can't make a consistent policy that would allow for freedom um so i think if that's what you're getting at i think that's yeah that's a very well i'm, I'm thinking about a, a dress code what should jen's perspective done because okay. all i want to know is what did we, where had we gone wrong where we, could mm-hmm. we do better the next time what should we have done what should we do in the future that was all i was really interested in and that's mm-hmm. where people became very incoherent along the lines of well you shouldn't have posted the tweet and it's like well okay so you're advocating for secrecy maybe okay we shouldn't have uh said check out the book it wasn't you know like there's very 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 few books on autogynophilia and a 600 page book on autogynophilia even if i didn't agree with any word of it and i i i I haven't been impressed with the book um i don't think that's relevant insofar as any new material on this massively under-researched, underspoken, hidden condition, frankly, is is very welcome. There is so few that is written about it that, uh, 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 you know, when we're saying check it out, we're saying check out the fact there's autogynophilia. We're Jen Specht. We're very pro a healthy approach to, ge- to sex and gender. We don't believe in the hiding and the the way trans activists have hidden. And not only that, but they have kind of denied the existence of autogynophilia and we are very very into shining a light on autogynophilia and the fact that you know Phil Ellie is prepared to wear a dress and call himself autogynophile he defies trans activists who are busy saying it doesn't exist it's all like well if it doesn't exist this guy says he's autogynophile so how, how can you square that so we need brave people to come out and say that they're autogynophiles and you know, on one level, I'd say more people have come out saying that they're autogynophile, but less, fewer will come out as a result of what's happened in the last few weeks because they're, you know, they they have definitely been told to put it away, keep it secret, keep it hidden. And now the likelihood of us knowing, arguably, I would prefer to know that guy in the dress is an autogynophile than to not know and to be aware that there's autogynophiles there. I, you know, I, I'm kind of more into um, knowing than not knowing. But what you were talking about, the free speech, I agree with you because I, I, I very much, I'm, I'm pro free speech and I'm also pro workable policies. And I can't see what the dress code could have been. I, I cannot think of a dress code that would be feasible, workable, and uh, wouldn't be, um, frankly, um, used as a, a, a hammer against us. And we're, I suppose our, the, the way Genspec runs, our big kind of premise is a non-medicalized approach to gender. We, we want a healthy approach. So we're not going to say autogynophilia isn't a paraphilia. We've said it a thousand times. There was one tweet and it was a, a measure of the mobbing that we got that people literally trolled our 32,000 tweets and they found one tweet where one member of the team said it was an unusual sexual orientation. They made a mistake. Honestly, you know, we're a grassroots organisation. We became very big, very fast. And, you know, and we had volunteers in 2021 when the tweet was, uh, was and they, they found it in the last couple of weeks. They found it and hit us over the head with it. And I'm like, yeah, we made a mistake. We make mistakes. We make loads of mistakes. That's that's part of being human. Um, but it's been sad. The whole thing has been sad because what I would like and what Genspect tries to work towards is encouraging all the groups to pull together, to encouraging all the different organizations to be aware. You know, like it's great that Kelly J. Keane goes out and does let women speak. Good for her. But I don't see any need to pull us down while we're doing something completely different, which is conferences and letting out the gender framework, which is a non-medicalized approach. But it's great that another organization like, you know, Sex Matters is all about legislation and policy in the UK. Yeah, it's great. It's great that, you know, um, Philia exists and Women's Place UK and all these different organizations, um, let's say, in America as well and 
Geta, which I think is called Therapy First now. You know, it's great to see all the different organizations. They're needed. Every single one of these organizations are needed. Every single one of these organizations. There's more than enough work for all of us. And all I'm hoping is that we could pull together and agree to disagree on the finer points, but have a kind of good faith acknowledgement that each of us are doing our best. And yet there's utter disagreement around various aspects, utter disagreement. But that doesn't mean you try to pull down and close the entire organisation or try to catch them out in bad faith, like misrepresentation and lies, because there was an awful lot of lies about Genspect by a few bad faith actors who just won't stop lying. And they keep on saying things like, I'm pro-transing children. Jen Specht is pro-true trans. These are just lies. They've been disproved a thousand times over. So the bad faith actors who continuously lie are something that are fascinating, but very demoralizing. I've actually, I've got to lose tooth after my stress. I'm very annoyed. Oh, no. <laughs> I've got to lose a tooth. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. It does seem like a reflection of the stress. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the bad faith actors are the ones that my brain melts with. Because I'm like, just don't lie. Just, just do your work. I'll do mine. You know what I mean? You go your way. I go your, I go this way. We're trying to lift all the organizations. But um, yeah, maybe after the bitterness of the last few weeks, maybe some people will realise pulling together is a better road to go, but maybe they won't. Well, I mean, I hope so. And I'm sorry it's been so hard on you. And, you know, it's it's a horrible thing. People who are just having their little fun on Twitter, they don't understand how it feels to be mobbed by thousands of people. Um, you know, it is devastating. And, um, I've never had anything on this scale, even close, but I had a an experience of it as well. And it, the stress it puts you through is is, incre is incredible. And, um, you know, I will say, just using my own reaction to the picture, I guess, as an example, um, I saw it and I was like, okay, um, you know, I interesting. What is this about? Um, Jen Specht is recommending this book I'd like to see what this is no like I didn't have you know a reaction so far I was like okay let me see what this is clicked through to his profile and that's when kind of you know I had my own reaction I had my own knee-jerk reaction I was Fair like enough. I don't really I don't like this because he's talking about um auto heterosexuality as its own sexual orientation and it was very it seemed to me to be very overt that this was his uh, arousal point, I guess. Um, and then, like you said, I was drawn to reading all this drama. And so I was reading all these tweets and seeing a lot of people reacting, I mean, on both sides, but pe a lot of people who I respect and listen to and follow um, saying kind of um, almost sneering at women for being for having that emotional reaction to it for that and like you mentioned earlier in our discussion that like visceral disgust feeling that okay. I guess is more Impressive. common in women but um but you know like for example there was like Benjamin Boyce and you know I respect him but I saw him kind of it seemed like he was lumping in women who objected to just autogynophilia um lumping them in with like crazy feminazis i mean i think is kind of what he said which um i do think that there is an importance for um you know looking at being on it well it's like you said things have to be brought out into the light and brought out into the open but where for me things just went completely off the rails and wrong was people in any way attacking gen spec i mean you know that didn't even occur to me i when I first had, you know, my own reaction, I made a tweet because for some reason I decided I should chime in and I ended up deleting it because, and I just tweeted, you know, it's, I, I want people to be curious about this condition. I'm not though. And, you know, you can't tell me to not have my reaction, but I ended up deleting it because I saw all these people were attacking Genspec in bad faith, as you said. Um, but there was, so it was so much more than just that sort of disagreement yeah um which like i said i myself kind yeah. of came down on that but you know what it could have been about that 
It could have been amazing. It mm. could have, it could have, we could have all of that energy, all those sub stacks, the, the four videos Kelly J devoted to it and all the Twitter spaces, all the, all the YouTubes. It could have been all about how should we handle autogynophilia? You, you know what I mean? This idea of, I don't want to handle it. Well, I, I, fair, fair enough. But it's there. I don't want to handle any of it. I don't want to handle this. You know what I mean? The fact is, male sexuality has been a burden on women for um, thousands of millions of years, as far as I can see. It has been a burden on society. And there's extremities in male sexuality that are perverse and deviant. And we, women and children, suffer this. You know what I mean? Now, what are we going to do about that as a society? I don't know, but... We do need to think about it. The people who are interested in in thinking about how do we handle this? Because just saying, no, 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 I don't want to think about it. Fair enough, fair enough. But they're there. They're going to be flashers on the bus. They're going to be there. And we have to kind of figure out, yeah, we, we need, you know, obviously crime prevention, but we need to figure out how to handle this. And the only way I believe forward is kind of discussion that figures out what we're going to do about this. And I, I think it's really tricky, really, really hard. And um, I would hope that further conversation will bring about that. And I know some people have no interest in that. I don't care about them. I want to talk to the people who are interested in dealing with the trickier parts of life because we kind of, I think, as a society, we owe it to the young people to try and find better solutions. Yeah. Um you know, there can be that discussion about, um, like you said, there's there are these male perversions and a lot of women have had their own experiences of being traumatized in their personal lives and then they don't even want to acknowledge that these things exist. But part of this entire, I mean, part of what it seems to me your your work is opening those things up so that we can talk about it because Either. one of the things that leads, you know, kids to being trans to identifying as trans is whatever trauma they may have gone through and their inability to look at it acknowledge it um and work through it with an accepting that like you said it exists in the world so it may bother us but it's not going to go away just because we don't want to see it yeah yeah and too many parents have you know come to me with deep distress about their children and you know, we're, go we're going to have to tackle it. Some people are going to have to tackle this really difficult issue. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, it's been a very difficult time. And I would love if out of it some bright spark came up with some idea about how to handle, hello, Kat, how I'm to sorry, handle um, autogynophilia. You know, how do we handle it? A non medicalized guy who wears a dress, who is asking others to participate in this fetish, but is being very respectful, you know, how to handle that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I haven't have seen, to... yeah, I haven't seen a good response yet to that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So let's just maybe end going back to something in the book there was one also really powerful thing in the book where you talk about your own experience as a kid who at one point you wanted to be a boy and then when you talked about when you kind of the difficulty of coming back from that that was a really interesting insight where you talked about you know for the parents when the kid is maybe starting to desist don't even you know bat an eyelash oh, at it yeah, that was now, really interesting. I say that only from my own experience, completely biased, because some parents it might it, that mightn't be, uh, you know what I mean. But for for me, uh, if somebody commented, it set me back months, months. It was unbelievable how sensitive I was to it, and I can only my my conclusion about that was. It feels like it is locked up with my sexual development that I was so insanely private about it why did, it didn't matter to anybody why didn't I just say oh I'm over that 
It was like the most important secret of my life that nobody figured out. Imagine you're trying to dress a different way. You're trying to act a different way because you want to lose the whole boy thing. But you want nobody to notice. Like, <laughs> how, was I, how exactly was I going to pull that off? Well, the, my grand plan was one piece at a time, one tiny centimeter at a time over many years, I was going to pull that off. And that was how I was doing it. And that's how I tried to do it. And, you know, I ultimately got there. But like, how insane. And that might be your kid. It mightn't be. Other kids are very different. But it was, I just thought it was important that I, I put that bit in. And I'm glad you raised it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it really struck me because it was so true about teenagers. Sometimes you just cannot bring attention to the thing. And maybe this is a lesson for people on Twitter as well. You know, the overreactiveness doesn't get the response you want. And so I mean, the book is absolutely full of just incredibly practical advice. I mean, there are scripts in here for suggestions on how to talk to your kid, how to talk to their teacher, therapist. Um, mm -hmm people who may be trying to intervene like a friend or a family relative who's trying to come in and say you know you need to let your kid transition what are, what's wrong with you and there's just so much incredible advice and Thank you. um yeah and and i think it's it's such a powerful resource for parents and they need it i know they need it i've heard from them even on my own platform and um they are some of the worst victims here and not to well no there's no need to say who's the worst victim but yeah. um but it's really atrocious and it's really heartbreaking what's happening so thank you so much for all the work you're doing i thank know you. it's making a difference and, oh thanks i hope so yeah i, I know it is parents yeah. that are praising hallelujah for this book and um so you know please go out check out the book and check out Stella's work I'll link everything I'll link the book on Amazon and thank you Stella I really appreciate you coming on addressing this and I hope that you're able to maybe in the new year take some time off oh, and yeah. enjoy no. maybe enjoy the fruits of your labors a little yeah, bit yeah. no as I've, well. I've, I've nothing major planned so I'm I'm ready to take things handy thank you okay. I really enjoyed that yeah absolutely thank you so much we'll end it there